Welcome to the Organic Chemistry Podcast, Dr. Brian Lloyd's Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures and Solutions to Homework Problems. In this podcast lecture, we're continuing looking at the reactions of alcohols. Last lecture, we looked at the preparation of alcohols. And now we're going to answer the question, how do alcohols react? We're going to begin by examining, examining substitution reactions. Those are the SN1, SN2 reactions that alcohols follow. Now what's interesting is if we examine an alcohol with various nucleophiles, we very quickly discover that alcohols, when reacted with the same nucleophiles we use for alkyl halides, nucleophile could be, for example, I- minus or hydroxide or uh, other negatively charged or neutral molecules like cyanide. The alcohol does not react. We get no reaction, NR, no reaction. And one has to ask the question, why? Reason has to do with the leaving group. If reaction did take place, we would have to kick out an OH minus, a hydroxide. Hydroxide's a powerful base. Weak bases are good leaving groups. Strong bases are poor leaving groups. The alcohol group is such a bad leaving group that attacking with nucleophiles does not lead to reaction. However, if I take the same alcohol, and I react it with a fairly powerful acid, I'll get an equilibrium, if it's a strong acid, with appreciable amounts of protonated alcohol. You see, the OH group has lone pairs, and if you add protons, you will get protonation. However, alcohol is not a super powerful base. As a result, the acid has to be fairly strong to get significant amounts of what we might refer to as the oxonium ion. The oxonium ion being the H2O plus attached to the R. Now, if attacked by a nucleophile, the nucleophile binds to the carbons, the R group. R is just a symbol we use to mean carbons, like methyl, ethyl, carbon chains. The nucleophile now binds to R, and the leaving group is water. Water is not as powerful a base as hydroxide. Water is a weaker base, hence it is a better leaving group. Now, the most obvious combination of H plus a nucleophile are the hydrogen halides. Molecules like HI, HBr. HCl, hydroiodic, hydrobromic, hydrochloric acids, even HF. Now if we examine these molecules with respect to their acidity and their nucleophilicity, we come up with an interesting trend. For example, in terms of acidity, HI is the stronger acid. HI is stronger than HBr. HBr is stronger than HCl. And HI is greater than HBr, greater than HCl, who's greater than HF. What that means is the H plus of hydroiodic will cause more equilibrium shift to the right in this equilibrium, increasing the concentrations of the oxonium ion. Likewise, HBr will do more protonation than HCl will. Increasing the concentration of the oxonium ion will make more molecules available 
for nucleophilic attack. The next interesting point is looking at the nucleophile position, I minus versus Br minus. I minus is a stronger nucleophile than Br minus. I minus is larger, more polarizable, better able to direct the negative charge to the delta plus on carbon. Because of this, I minus is a stronger nucleophile. The stronger acid is also yielding the stronger nucleophile, so this trend also serves for halide reactivity. HI is the most reactive. It is the strongest acid. I minus is the strongest nucleophile. It is the most reactive. Okay. What's interesting is all alcohols react with HI and BR. All alcohols react with HI and HBr. HI and HBr are such strong acids producing enough protonation and such strong nucleophiles that tertiary, secondary, methyl, primary alcohols all react with HI and HBr. However, with HI, only benzylic Allylic and tertiary, only benzylic, allylic, and tertiary react with HCl. If you want secondary and primary to react, you need HCl with a catalyst plus zinc chloride. You see, HCl is just not powerful enough to protonate the alcohol sufficiently enough as an acid to get appreciable concentrations of oxonium ion. Also, chloride is such a weaker nucleophile. This combination produces slower and lesser reactivity. However, if you add zinc chloride, which is a powerful Lewis acid, zinc chloride is a very strong Lewis acid. It means it accepts electrons. It accepts electrons because it has an empty orbital. And so the electrons from the oxygen can bind with the zinc. The lone pair on the OH can attack the zinc. When it binds to zinc, the CO bond weakens, and essentially zinc chloride bound to the oxygen makes a better leaving group. So the whole point is getting a good enough leaving group allowing reaction. Then chloride can attack if you have a good enough leaving group. Now this reagent, HCl, zinc chloride combo, it's called Lucas reagent. Lucas reagent. That's an S. Probably ran out of room writing this. Lucas reagent. And I certainly did. Yeah. Lucas reagent. Now, let's take a look at how Lucas reagent would cause a reaction with a primary alcohol. Suppose I have R CH two OH Lucas reagent. If you have HCl, 
Lucas reagent is the powerful acid. It is a Lewis acid. It doesn't donate protons, but it accepts the electron. And so what you get is these electrons go for the zinc. plus oxygen minus on zinc. And this group right here is a good leaving group. You see, if the Lewis acid is a fairly strong acid, then once it's bound, the group that leaves is a weak base, not a very good Lewis base, and that makes a good leaving group. Okay, so now we can have Cl minus attack. And in a primary case, the Cl minus will come around top and attack. Backside attack, you get it kicked out. You get R C H two C L. The C L minus comes from the H C L. And of course, you're gonna get the H O zinc. So the H O is still attached to the zinc. Now, instead of having C L two, one of the chlorides gets kicked out. So zinc 2 plus, you get HOZ and Cl. That prevents it being zinc minus. And you produce, when Cl gets kicked out, a chloride minus. And so the zinc dichloride increases the ability of the OH group to leave. It acts just the same way H plus did, or acid did, because it is a Lewis acid. Now... If we're going to look at mechanisms in alcohols, primary alcohols react via SN2. Secondary and tertiary alcohols react via SN1. Now, here's a question. Let's compare this statement, and this applies to these hydrogen halides, a hydroiodic acid, HBr, HCl. How does this stack up when we compare the reactivity with alkyl halides? And I certainly can add methanol, methyl to this, so let's put methyl on this. Methyl primary go SN2, secondary tertiary go SN1. If I remember my trend for alkyl halides, methyl primary indeed did go SN2. Tertiary indeed did go SN1. But in alkyl halides, secondary could go either. Secondary did SN2 slowly and SN1 slowly. And which path it went depended on the strength of the nucleophile. So what's causing the change here? Why is SN1 being more favored for secondary than SN2? Well, if you remember when we examined the SN1 mechanism, we had some favored by statements. And the key features, we said the SN1 was favored by weaker nucleophiles, lower reaction temperatures, and polar protic solvents. Turns out this is important. In alkyl halides, the best you can do is dissolve an alkyl halide in an alcohol-water mixture. That's as polar as you can get. In this system, we're reacting in alcohol, probably in an aqueous system with hydroiodic acid. Now, water is pretty polar, but once you add ions to it, acidic, strong acids, the polarity goes through the roof. 
most polar solvents that you can make are acids. Acids ionize, and when you ionize, you get polarity. And because the polarity of the solvent is jumped so high when you react alcohols, it's increased so much, the SN1 predominates over the SN2, and secondary, in situations where you have these extremely polar units, favor the SN1. Okay. Well, let's examine the SN2 and SN1 mechanisms on an alcohol. Essentially, these reactions are not changed very much. And let's consider methyl. Let's start with the SN2, methyl or primary. So I'm going to draw a molecule here. As I said, these are not, these reactions are not changed very much. So I've got C3. H7, let's say, and then an H. I want to make it chiral. So in place of the H, I'm going to have a deuterium. And my OH group. So if I prioritize, I get one for the oxygen, two for the carbon, three for the deuterium. This is S. I have S, 1. Now, I have seen both the deuterio and deutero used as a prefix name. Doesn't matter which you use. Here's deuterio. Okay, I've also seen just O, deutero. 1, deuterio, butan. one all. So this is a one butanol. It's S. The first step as always, as always is protonation. This is not really part of the SN2, but it's required for the SN2 to occur. So here is the resulting oxonium ion. Now, let's pretend we were using HBr. So the nucleophile comes in now. And the nucleophile is going to be Br minus. How about that? Now, in SN2, the nucleophile does backside attack. So the nucleophile goes to the back, comes in on the backside opposite, past the junk in the trunk, so to speak. And we go through a transition state. So let's redraw our transition state. And so we're going to have Br, we're going to have a C, we're going to have the O, H, H, lone pair. And I'm going to change color for the bond forming. And we always write which bonds are forming, which bonds are breaking, but that's fine. So I also get my three groups in a trigonal plane because carbon has rehybridized. So carbon is rehybridized. I have carbon in a trigonal plane. This is a D, not an O. I'm trying to make it look 
more look at D. This bond is breaking. You always label which bond is breaking and you also label which bond is forming. This bond is forming. You also indicate what's happening to the charge. Now, if you compared this to an alkyl halide, Let's say we were doing a bromide on a chloride, bromide attack, and the chloro was leaving. We would have a delta minus because Br minus would be shifting its charge, and we'd have a delta minus on the leaving group. If you look back in alkyl halides, you'll see delta minus, delta minus. Here I'm going to draw delta minus on the bromine because he's transferring his charge. As the bond forms, he's moving his negative charge from the bromine up to the oxygen. But the oxygen was positively charged. That means the negative charge that's transferring over the oxygen, as this bond heterolytically breaks, that negative charge as it transfers the oxygen is reducing the positive charge. A reduced positive charge is delta plus. And so you'll notice this charge is different than the type of charge we've drawn in the case of alkyl halides. And so don't be confused by that. The reason it's a delta plus is because the atom had a positive charge to begin with. If it was neutral, and negative charge was transferring, you'd be getting a delta minus here. So you draw the appropriate charge. Double dagger means transition state. So this is our five coordinate transition state for the SN2. And as the reaction completes, we have shown inversion of the chiral center. And what I see C3H7, my deuterium. If I prioritize this, bromos 1, carbons 2, deuterium 3, this is R, 1 bromo. one deutero or deuterio. We'll go with deutero this time. Butan, one all. I've seen both prefixes used for deuterium. I think deuterio is the better one, but I'm not sure. We'll stick with this. And you get standard SN2. This goes for methyl primary. Methyl primary do not go SN1 because the energy of the carbocation would be too high. And backside attack occurs much more easily. Okay, let's take a look at the scenario for secondary and tertiary alcohols by looking at the SN1 reaction mechanism. Now, if we have secondary and tertiary alcohols, secondary and tertiary alcohols, use can undergo SN1 and of course as always with alcohol step one is not really SN1 but it allows the alcohol to get ready to react and it is protonation. Protonation. Protonation we have a CH3 here. We're going to have another CH3 H and an OH. 
We react this with some acids. In this case, let's say we're using HBr. Either way, it's the H plus comes in and reacts. And it protonates the alcohol. Long pair there. And so we've got protonated alcohol. Step two. Step two is sometimes called ionization. It's also called carbocation formation. In fact, you could even call it, because we're kicking out water, loss of water. Probably the best name is carbocation formation because it clearly describes what is happening. And so our protonated water molecule a protonated alcohol. The leaving group it will be water. So it's not a protonated water. Sorry about that. It's a protonated alcohol. The leaving group is water. So minus H2O means water leaves. This is our slow step. Carbocation formation is always slow. Protons, protonation go, goes on and off. Proton goes on, it goes off, it's an equilibrium, it happens really fast. But kicking out the water and making the carbocation is actually the rate determining step. We talked a lot about that when we gave you the lecture on the SN1 and E1 reaction mechanisms. We discussed it more in detail in the SN1. So we get a carbocation here. Step three, of course, is no surprise. Step three, you always look when you have carbocation for rearrangement. Rearrangement is sift simply shifting of a group from one carbon to the neighboring carbon in order to create a more stable carbocation. The molecule will rearrange to lower energy. So if you can, I don't know if I have room, I will try to draw this here. Take a look at what kind of carbocation you have. What kind of carbocation is this molecule? Well, the carbon with the plus is two carbons, so it's secondary. And if I do a one, two, hydrogen shift, I do a 1-2 hydrogen shift, shift this hydrogen over, I will get this guy. Got a little more room now.
Okay, so rearrangement occurs really fast because it is an intramolecular reaction. It doesn't require you to wait for intramolecular collision. So it's much faster than a nucleophilic attack. The one shift actually will occur quickly. Now, step four. Step four will be nucleophilic attack. We have the tertiary carbocation, it's more stable. Our tertiary carbocation is susceptible to attack by a nucleophile. So step four is nucleophilic So this reaction essentially goes the same as what we've seen for alkyl halides. No surprises here in this reaction mechanism. Step four, nucleophilic attack on the carbocation, our nucleophile, in this case, is Br minus. And he adds to the carbocation, producing an alkyl halide. And we get SN1. Now, remember with SN1, I haven't shown chirality. In fact, the 1, 2 shift, if there was chirality, got rid of it because of the two identical methyls. And that happens sometimes can lose chirality in a molecule uh, because of shifting. But if we had a chiral center and the chiral center was retained and there was no shifting that got rid of it, then you have the potential of creating a racemic mixture. Of course, you don't have to draw the racemate unless I show the individual chirality. If I show the a pure enantiomer, you show racemization. If I do not show the chirality, well, you may assume we're starting with the racemate and you don't have to worry about it then. Racemization always occurs, but we only show it when we're given chiral molecules. Okay, this is what happens, how alkyl halides are made from alcohols, SN1, SN2, if we use hydrogen halides. But there are other methods for preparing alkyl halides. These other methods work... Other methods for turning alcohols into alkyl halides, they work efficiently with methyl, primary, and secondary alcohols. They work with methyl, primary, and secondary alcohols. They involve the reagents. So if we have an alcohol, they involve reagents such as, I'm going to have to make that longer probably, PX3. PX3 would be called phosphorus trihalide. X can equal chlorine or bromine, either one. So you could have phosphorus trichloride, which would be two words, or phosphorus tribromide, two words, phosphorus space tribromide. Or you could use SOCl2. SOCl2 is called thionyl chloride. Better spell that one out. I think you know how to spell phosphorus, and I think you know how to spell chloride, but thionyl is tricky. So thionyl space chloride. It's a new name for you to learn. SOCl2 could be used, or you could use PX5, and that's phosphorus pentahalide. And X, again, could be chloride or bromide. So you could use phosphorus pentachloride or phosphorus pentabromide. And this will make... Rx, where X in the case of thionyl chloride is chloro, or X in the case of phosphorus halides is chloro bromo. Rx 
plus what happens to the reagent, depending on the reagent you use. Let's take a look, closer look at these reactions. Suppose, again, I have ROH, and more specifically this time, I am using PCL3. Phosphorus trichloride. Phosphorus trichloride. Now, this reaction's interesting because you usually think of protonating the alcohol making good leaving group because that's what we've been doing, and attacking the R, doing some kind of SN1, SN2. But remember back in alkyl halides, we learned that alcohols were weak nucleophiles. Alcohols don't have to just be attacked. They can do the attacking. And chlorine's very electronegative, more electronegative than phosphorus. Three chlorines are going to withdraw electrons and put a delta plus on phosphorus. It is perfectly possible to get alcohol to attack the PCL3. If the alcohol attacks, you will get RO attached to PCL2, and the H and a chlorine would have left to form HCl. Now, the HCl will give you a chloride minus, and this OPCL2 is a good leaving group. Chloride could do backside attack, SN2 attack and you kick out the OPCL2. And the other two chlorines on the PCL2 could react the same way until you've produced three oxygen bonds to phosphorus and you've made three RCLs. So this can happen several times until you get three, okay, so that's, I'm gonna put three alcohols, produce three RCLs, and you produce phosphorus, H3, PO3 phosphorus acid. Now, this reaction goes really well in high yield, but it only works with methyl primary secondary because it does SN2. It gives you inversion. We produce this good leaving group, and Cl- comes around and does backside attack kicking out the OPCL2. Or if you had RO, 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 and all the CLs were replaced, it would happen one at a time. Eventually, you produce phosphorus acid plus your alkyl halide. Quite nice. But I'm not going to look at this mechanism in detail. And this portion, you do not have to know. I only give it to you so that you might better understand how the SN2 is working. It's working because this alcohol is acting as a nucleophile. It's adding to phosphorus first. Okay, let's look at SOCl2 because it's very interesting. SOCl2 gives us different results depending on what kind of solvent you use it in. So SOCl2. Now, SOCl2, if we react it in an amine solvent, When I say amine solvent, I mean something like triethylamine, okay? Something like, uh, you know, you might have three ethyl groups off here. So CH2, CH3, three times. Nitrogen has three ethyls, triethylamine, it has a lone pair, it's very basic. So there's a typical uh, amine solvent that you could use, but there are others. While well, you get R, Cl plus SO2 gas. The SO2 gas will bubble out a solution. And you'll also get HCl. But the HCl does not hang around as HCl. The HCl quickly combines with the amine. If you had NR3, I'll just write it here. If you had NR3 solvent, you'd end up getting NHR3. The acid would protonate that lone pair, giving you plus a cation and Cl minus. 
So your HCl gets trapped out as an ammonium salt in this system because of the amine. But SO2 gas bubbles out of solution. The arrow pointing up means to bubble out of solution. You can also react this guy in ether solvent. We've used ether in the lab already. The most common is diethyl ether. But there are others you can use. For example, you could use a solvent like this, tetrahydrofuran, for example, a cyclic ether. If you react in ether, you get RCl plus SO2 gas, which bubbles out a solution. Now, there's no amine around, so HCl forms, and it's not soluble in ether to a huge extent, so it also is gaseous and bubbles out a solution. So you get HCl gas bubbling out a solution. This actually reaction is quite nice because your side products actually bubble out a solution as a gas, leaving just your product in the ether, which is quite nice. There may be a trace amount of dissolved SO2 gas and HCl gas, but most of it bubbles out. So uh, it looks the same. Well, what's the difference? Well, suppose my alcohol was chiral. Suppose it was R. Suppose I had a chiral alcohol that was R. This R being the chirality. Prioritization is clockwise. And suppose that the, when the chloride forms, there's no weird change to prioritization. The alcohol is the highest priority group that leaves, and chloride is the highest priority group that goes on. If there's no huge prioritization switch, then amine solvent goes SN2, and you get inversion of the chiral center, so we form S. But something very strange happens in ether solvent. In ether solvent, we get retention, retention of the chiral center, retention of chirality. Retention, what the heck's retention? R stays R. The chirality does not change. We have not seen a mechanism that gives retention. And so we must very closely look at what's going on in ether solvent. But to better understand what goes on in ether solvent, Let's look at a more familiar mechanism, the SN2. Let's first look at amine solvent. Okay, before we look at what happens in either solvent system, we really need to have a good understanding of the structure of SOCl2. So let's draw SOCl2s, SOCl2s, Lewis structure. If I add up the electrons, sulfur is 6, oxygen is 6, Chlorine is 7, 2 times 7 is 14, 6 plus 6 is 12. We get 26 valence electrons. Great. Okay, so sulfur has 6. Here we go. There's 6. Oxygen has 6. Chlorine has seven. Chlorine has seven. And now we can link up. Well, if I join these and make a covalent bond, chlorine gets eight. Chlorine gets eight. Two, four, six, eight. Sulfur is 8, so make a data bond to oxygen. I would get this structure. So chlorine has filled octet. Every atom has filled octets. Count up my electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 2, 4, 6. If I did formal charge, I'd find oxygen is minus 1, sulfur is plus 1. Now, the only thing to realize is while this accepts all our Lewis structure rules, sulfur is in the third row. Because of this, sulfur has empty 3D orbitals of high energy that are accessible. And hence, sulfur can violate the octet rule. So I'm going to dump in these two electrons from the lone pair and draw this structure as an alternative Lewis structure that is acceptable. 
And I'm actually going to use this structure as the structure of our thionyl chloride. And we have some interesting effects going on here. We see our structure, oxygen has uh, sulfur bound to it, chlorine has the sulfur. The chlorines are an oxygen's attached to sulfur. Chlorines and oxygens are electronegative. In this structure, we see clear positive charge on sulfur. In this structure, it's very easy to infer a delta plus on sulfur. This makes sulfur susceptible to nucleophilic attack. And that is what information the, the Lewis structure gives us. So when we react this guy with alcohol, the alcohol is going to act as a nucleophile. The question is, do we have a weak or strong nucleophile? Well, let's consider what happens in amine solvent. In amine solvent, okay, so this is in amine, Solvent. The first step of the mechanism occurs because amine is a powerful base. And I'm going to show what happens using a chiral molecule. I'll draw fissures so we can observe what happens to chirality since this thing is the um, distinction between amine and ether solvent. What happens to chirality? We have base attack. Amine's a base and the base attacks the alcohol, so no problem. And let's use as our reaction sec-butyl alcohol, 2-butanol, so here's my OH, here's my CH2, 3, and an H. I think I'll just write that as C2H5 next time for the ethyl. And our base, I'm going to just use any base. So I'm going to use three R groups. They could be ethyls, propyls. And this amine will establish an equilibrium. Because amine is a powerful base. It certainly will produce some of the deprotonated alcohol. This will not affect the chiral center. C2H5, CH3. So chirality is unaffected, and we get O minus here. Now, if I was to check the chirality, one, two, three, interchange, that would be S. Yes, this would be the R. 2-butanol. Okay, so this molecule is R. Now, step two, of course, is nucleophilic attack. The deprotonated alcohol we formed is an alkoxide, and alkoxides are powerful bases. So we've got a nucleophilic attack on the thionyl. So this is not the SN2. This is, if you like, nucleophilic addition, nucleophilic attack. It's not substitution. We're actually initially adding to it, but I guess we are substituting for a chloride. We'll just call it nucleophilic attack. So I've got my alkoxide. Here. I have my alkoxide and I'm going to write my thionyl chloride here. I'm going to write it this way. Don't forget the lone pair on sulfur. And the alkoxide will add and the pi electrons will move out to the oxygen. When I'm done, again, the chiral of center is not affected by this reaction because the reaction is taking place at the oxygen, not at the chiral carbon. It should be three. So we have our oxygen with its lone pairs. 
attached to a sulfur. There is an O minus here. We have a Cl. We have a Cl. And we still have that lone pair on sulfur. Now, what happens in step three is reformation of the S double bond O. Hopefully I can fit this on here. Reformation of the S double bond O, which results in the elimination of the chloride group. So overall, step two and step three is the substitution of the alkoxide for chloride. Elimination of Cl minus. So this molecule, I draw again. O three lone pairs Cl Cl lone pair and what happens is the lone pair dumps back in to make a double bond here and the chloride takes its two electrons and leaves and so what you get Again, so far, there's been no effect on the chiral center. Now, all three of these steps proceed to make a good leaving group. This guy is a good leaving group. And look what you've created. A chloride nucleophile. You've got a good leaving group, chloride nucleophile here. You're all set up to do an SN2 on that chiral carbon. The oxygen puts a delta plus on carbon and you're ready for backside attack. So let's draw step four. Step four, the chloride comes in and does backside attack on our chiral center. Now, if we just stayed with simple backside attack, we would be kicking out this, the H inverts, CL goes on here, where it attacked, the H inverts, we got a C2H5. And so if I prioritize and check, this is s sacbutyl chloride, or s 2 chlorobutane we would get off, given off, O minus here, S, oh, don't forget your lone pair on the sulfur. I probably forgot that on my last few drawings I previously raised. You get this, but this molecule very quickly falls apart. In fact, I sometimes 
draw it as falling apart when it leaves simultaneously. Okay, If this dumped in, you have the lone pair here, and chloride left, you would get SO2 gas, which would look like this. Okay, and Cl minus. So you regenerate a Cl minus. This guy could fall apart after he leaves, or it could fall apart as he's leaving. This is SO2 gas. It bubbles out a solution. And notice you formed the inverted product, and step four was your actual SN2. Everything up to step four was getting ready, getting a good leaving group so you could do the backside attack. And that is the mechanism in amine solvent. What we're really interested in looking at, of course, is what goes on in the case of the ether solvent system. Ether is different than amine. Ether is not basic. So the first difference is step one. Whereas the amine had a deprotonation of the alcohol because it's a powerful base, in ether you don't get that step. We effectively jump the step one of the amine step. And in ether, our weak nucleophile, the alcohol, acts as a nucleophile on thionyl chloride. If you like, we could call this alcoholic. Nucleophilic. Attack. So alcoholic nucleophilic attack, let's use the same alcohol. So C2H5, CH3, H, or H, and have it attack our thionyl chloride. The alcohol is two lone pairs here. This is my lone pair on sulfur, and it could attack sulfur. Again, the pi electrons could move out to the oxygen, and we would get this intermediate. and there's still a lone pair on sulfur. So we've got an H plus and a Cl. Now, step two is interesting. And has to do with the polarity of the solvent. We can't eliminate chloride the way we did in amine solvent. Why not? Well, remember we restored the S double bond O and Cl minus left. Formation of S double bond O is favorable and chloride's a good leaving group. But the problem is ether is not very good at solvating ions. To eliminate an anion, the solvent molecules must essentially surround the anion. They must be able to solvate the anion, and then ions will leave. Even if you have a good leaving group, if it can't be kicked out because the solvent won't solvate it, it's not soluble effectively in the solvent, it won't leave. It's got to find some other way of leaving. So Cl minus does not leave.
But it has a way around this. It can leave as a neutral species. Now, the neutral species is more soluble in ether than the anion. But even it isn't very soluble but it can escape the solution which allows it to leave. So these electrons come back in to build the double bond. The two electrons to chlorine go after the hydrogen, and then the hydrogen leaves and its two electrons go back on the oxygen. And so it's elimination of HCl gas. The HCl is basically kicked out and it bubbles out a solution. So let's draw that again. I'm going to make it a little bigger so we actually can see the electrons move. So I'm going to make this unit quite large. Exaggerate that. So effectively what happens is those two electrons come in and reform the S double bond O. These two electrons go for the H. And hydrogens, two electrons to the oxygen, go back to the oxygen to create a lone pair. And you kick out HCl. So effectively you get to the same molecule, the same good leaving group we had in amine solvent. And HCl gas forms and it bubbles out a solution. Now we have another problem. This guy is a good leaving group. He will leave as the O minus S double bond OCL. But he can't leave because we're an ether solvent and ether can't solvate the negatively charged species. Or well, you say can't it rearrange and form S2, SO2 gas and bubble out a solution? Well, then you get the Cl minus. So effectively, he can't leave because the solvent can't solvate the anion. So what happens? What happens in step three is intramolecular rearrangement. I'm actually splitting up, if you like, through a transition state more than an intermediate. But it'll help you better understand what's going on. So I call step three intramolecular rearrangement. In other words, the leaving group can't really leave. It has to stay closely associated with the carbon. intramolecular rearrangement. And so what happens the oxygen's attached to the sulfur and I bet you I've been leaving off that lone pair again. Make sure you don't do that. I'll be marking you to see if that lone pair is there. Make sure you're putting the lone pair on sulfur. Don't lose that lone pair. He doesn't leave. He actually shifts. And I'm going to draw the carbon halfway between the shift, if you like. So you got C2H5 up here. You have your H, you have your CH3, 
And I'm going to draw the oxygen with its lone pair here. The chlorine with its lone pairs. We're going to have sulfur, sulfur, double bond O. And I have an interaction between the carbon with the oxygen as it's leaving and with the chlorine. And there's a lone pair on sulfur. If you like, this whole unit is rotating. This whole leaving group's rotating. And the chlorine's beginning to interact with this group, and the oxygen's beginning to leave. When it actually, when the chlorine actually binds, this, this will leave, the two electrons will go towards the oxygen. And these two electrons, the sulfur chlorine bond, will move towards the carbon. And you will eliminate SO2 gas. So step four I call elimination. of SO2 gas. Is this a transition state? In actual fact, what we may actually have is a complex ion. A not full positive charge here, but an anion and a cation interacting very strongly, very closely associated. It may be an intermediate species. I want you to know we do not have pentavalent carbon there. What I'm trying to show is that the charges, lone pairs on the chlorine and oxygen, are sharing electron density. So let's draw that again. In fact, I'm going to spread it out a little bit so I can make it a little wider. Draw it a little more clearly. So we have the oxygen with its two lone pairs attached to sulfur, and we have a chlorine here. And there's an interaction with the chlorine's lone pairs. So here's the chlorine's lone pairs. And an interaction, if you like, there we have a lone pair and we have a double bond O. And the two electrons that were bonded to the oxygen shift to make an S double bond O. These two electrons move, or if you like, they become a lone pair, and the lone pair electrons move, effectively the same thing, and make a chlorine bond. And so when you're done, the chlorine's gone on right where the oxygen has left. And you end up kicking out this unit as that. With a lone pair, which is just SO2 gas. And it bubbles out a solution. But interesting to note, the chirality hasn't changed. The chlorine went on in the same position where the oxygen off the alcohol was. It's gone with retention. The retention's really driven by the nonpolar ether preventing the ions from separating. And it causes this intramolecular rearrangement. The mechanism is not SN1 or SN2. It's substitution. It is nucleophilic. But the best term to call it is I for internal or intramolecular. And so it is called the SNI mechanism. It is very rare. In fact, this is the only example you're going to see of it. And you should be able to give this reaction mechanism and the amine mechanism on a test. Now, this allows us to summarize what we have learned. But before we do, I do want to make one comment about the reagent, SOCl2. In the case of phosphorus trichloride, you could use bromide in place of it and put a bromine on, phosphorus tribromide. But you'll notice the reagents were PX3, P3, 
PX5 or SOCL2. There was no provision for SOBR2. Why was SOBR2 left out in no thionyl bromide, whereas with PX3 and PX5, you can use chlorine or bromine? The reason it was less left out, SOBR2 was left out, is that PX3, PX5, chlorine or bromine, and SOCL2 can be made and stored in a bottle. The reagents you can get off the shelf. You can make them, keep them, and store them. SOBR2 is so reactive, if you're going to use it, you have to make it right away. Even though it's not in a list of reagents, I want you to know that you can use SOBR2. I can give you thionyl bromide in a reaction. The good news is that the mechanisms are exactly the same. The only difference is you'll have a bromide here, and you'll end up putting a bromide on. The reaction mechanisms are exactly the same except in place of the chlorine, you have bromine. Okay, let's summarize what we've learned. We've learned that if we take an alcohol, a secondary alcohol, and I hit it with hydrogen halides, like HI, HBr, or because this is secondary, I hit it with HCl, let's say, and zinc chloride. Okay, so HCl plus zinc Cl2, Lucas reagent. This will go SN1, so I will get racemization. I'm not going to draw the products. You can draw them. You should by now know what a racemate. It puts a chlorine on in place of the OH. That's all. Okay, so you'd have a Cl, I'm not going to draw the C2H5CH3, how's that? And you get a racemate, a 50-50 mixture of this. In place of the OH, you get the chloride. I could hit it with PCl3, phosphorus trichloride, and that would give me inversion because it goes SN2. SN2, inversion would put the Cl on the side opposite where the OH was. The groups invert. If I use SOCl2 in amine solvent, okay, so let's use, I don't know, it's probably a gas, so I probably can't use it, but let's use trimethylamine. Lone pair. Amine solvent, I draw it like this. I also go SN2, and I get inversion. The same reaction as the PCL3. So the OH again, the CL goes on a position opposite where the OH was. But if I use SOCl2 in an ether, Let's use tetrahydrofuran. SOCl2 in the ether, I go SNI, and I get retention. Retention of stereochemistry. And the Cl goes on right where the OH was. What's fascinating about this is you can do any procedure. You have enough tools now to produce any effect on the chiral center. Rest, seracemic mixture, inversion, or retention. Well, there you have it. That's the end of another scribble cast. Next lecture, we're going to look at alcohols and elimination reactions. My name's Dr. Brian Lloyd. This is my scribble cast. Thank you very much.